I don't really see failure as failing. For me, I've, I guess, failed at lots of things that I've done, but I think they've all been building blocks to kind of get to the next level where I've got to in my running career. So I think you have to go through those failures to get to where you are. So I kind of see them as, yeah, stepping stones. Hi, I'm Carla. I'm an ultra runner that's pretty much fueled on cake and likes to do, yeah, distances that are have pretty much spiralled out of control a little bit. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about actually all the races that I'm going to do next year. So I'm going to do Seville Marathon in Feb to try and get a fast marathon time as a qualifying race for Comrades, which is later in the year. I'm going to go back and do Canyons, which I didn't finish this year, which I'm a little bit nervous about, actually, because I'm like, didn't finish it and I've got unfinished business. Like, normally I, I wouldn't care, but I do. Um, in August, I'm doing Comrades. So today we've got 15 minutes warm up. So nice, easy jog to begin with. Then we'll probably do some drills. Um, once those are finished, into the main session, which is 20 kilometers at four minutes a K. And then once we finish that, we've got 15 minute cool down and then we're going to eat donuts. A serious question for you right yeah. now. For today's session, yeah. how do you feel about being my windbreaker? <laughs> I think Mel is going to be both of our windbreakers. <laughs> The point of this conversation today is we're talking about failure. So when you hear the word failure, what does it mean to you? Before, yeah, if I failed at something, I would get upset. But then I've seen it that actually you can build on it because I've gone through failures where you've come out the other side and you're like, actually, if I hadn't failed at that, I wouldn't have kept on trying and I wouldn't have got to where I did. So I, I think I've probably turned it myself into a way that I can use it positively instead of just sulking about it, which you, I do, and then you get over it, <laughs> build on it. <laughs> it's easier when you can look back at it at the time, yeah. you're like, oh, this makes sense here. But then at the time it's like, this is really hard. Yeah. I'm gonna get through it type thing. Yeah. And I think you need to do that. You have to go through that being upset, but then looking at it rationally and figuring out what went wrong and why you failed and how you can build upon that for the next time. The first one you picked up on was talk about comrades uh, from Cape Town to comrades. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so in 2018, I was actually, I was planning to run from London to South Africa. And in preparation to doing that, I'd got in touch with some guys and they were like, oh, well, we're running from Cape Town to comrades. We're doing a comrades a day, which is 90 kilometers a day every day for 20 days and on the last day we're going to do comrades ultra do you want to do it so we all went out there were six of us who had never met before that met in cape town uh, with a support crew and we started off this run we're about 30 k's in and in the middle of some awesome little wine fields it's pretty sunshiny just starting with day two it's about 5 a.m been pissing down with rain for about 18 hours. How do you feel about starting day four? Slowly, like each day, one of us started to like fall apart and break a little bit. And on day five, I ended up tearing my quad. We've done about 22K and my stupid little quad, it's so sore can't even run and then by day six all of us were completely out of the game and because we had to do 90 kilometers a day that was the route that we had planned um 
we had to just keep rolling day to day to all the accommodation. So then I kind of changed my mind. My parents were coming out to watch the race and I was like, oh God, if I don't get to that start line, I think my mother might kill me. Um, so I was like, right, I'll just try and do as much distance as I can between now and comrades with what my leg could handle. So each day we just ran anywhere between 10K and 60K covering the route, which was really cool. I ended up running, I think it was like 820K up to the race day. On the day of the race, well, the day before we went to pick up our numbers. We just collected our numbers. How are you feeling? I'm, I'm giddy. <laughs> and they don't tell you, but I like opened the bag and I had like an elite wristband. I was like, this is hilarious. Like I've just run 820K in three weeks and stood on the start line and was like, oh, okay. I'm just gonna go until I blow. I like, I like doing that and just ran and like didn't look at my watch, didn't know how fast I was running, didn't have a clue about where I was. And then I suddenly you turn the corner right at the end of the race into the stadium and I could see on the clock six hours 50. And I was like, how on earth have I done that? And then they give you a rose if you're in the top 10. And then I'd cross the finish line in ninth place, which was just, it was just ridiculous. I still don't really know how I managed that, but. Yeah, it was weird because we had failed at the goal, but literally that day changed my life and my running career pretty much forever. The second failure we talked about is rebuilding. And you talked about when you're living at the start of the pandemic, you're living in South Africa. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so as the world started to go a bit mental last year, my parents were like, oh, we think you should probably come back to the UK. And I was like, nah, that's all right. Let me just see what's happening in South Africa first. And then two days later, they closed the borders. I was like, okay, winning. And then in South Africa, you weren't allowed to leave your house, like full stop. You had to stay in your house. And then two days later, I broke up with my boyfriend. We're living in the same house and couldn't leave the house. <laughs> So I spent a lot of time running up and down my driveway. <laughs> so I actually put a thing on social media and went, who wants to come for a run with me? So random people that I would be like, cool. I'm running at this time. I got their phone number, I'd WhatsApp call them. And then I'd chat to them as I ran for like an hour up and down my drive. And I'm gonna show you my loop. We run around here. Then it gets here, where I turn around, wish I was going into the big bad world, but I'm not. And then I go back up my hill and back to the house where we turn around again. Ooh. As I was doing that, I chatted to one friend and I was like, oh yeah, maybe I'll do the jog and run the length Legend. of the UK. And that's pretty much where that like seed today. got set. And it was, you know, even though at that point I was like, oh my God, this is demoralizing. Like a relationship's ended. I can't really live in South Africa anymore. I need to come back to the UK. I then moved back to the UK, moved back into my parents. I'm like 35, living with my parents again, didn't have a job, had 196 pounds to my name. And I was like, great, I'm gonna have to start again. But because I pretty much had nothing and I was like, I need to make this work. I'd had the idea of the business that I've got now at that point, And it just, I guess, sparked that fuel to go and do the jog and then set up my strength conditioning yoga for runners program, which now is like an amazing community. And we've got people like all over the world that have joined, which is awesome. And I think if I hadn't been at pretty much that rock bottom, I don't know if, I would have got everything rolling as quickly. Okay, third failure is talking about DNFs. And you talked about recent races. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so this year I've had three pretty bad races. Um, I had one which was Canyons in America in April, where I had awful stomach issues and pretty much spent a lot of time in the bush and then had to pull out. And then I did the British trials for the um, 
trail running world champs. Again, had massive stomach issues, had to pull out of that halfway through. And then I went and did CCC as part of the UTMB week at the end of August. It was going fine until like the last 10K when, yeah, I had to like walk five meters and sit on a rock, get up, walk five meters, sit on a rock. It was, yeah, horrific. But through all of this, right in the beginning when it started to happen, like Rini, who's a sports dietitian, and Esther, who works in like female hormones, they were like, oh, we think it might be hormonal, like what's happening? And I was like, okay. So we started to do blood tests and work through everything. It takes such a long time to make sure you get everything right. And I actually only found out last week that I did start to have like an energy deficit, which can lead to red S, which is quite that like it's not a good thing to have but it's yeah. quite common in um female runners but what had been happening is i feel myself really well like generally day to day but i was having some really big volume blocks of training before these big races like 100 mile weeks and where i thought i was eating enough i just wasn't quite eating enough and i was just getting myself into a bit of a deficit and that deficit was giving me hormonal issues and messing up my stomach in the race. Luckily, we caught it like really quickly because they had spotted it. And I think that's where it's like just having awesome people on your side um, who can see these things. And because we've spotted it quickly, now all I need to do when I've got big volume weeks, it's a pain, but I've got to just count all my calories. In a big block, I actually need to eat like 4,000 calories a day some days, which is really difficult. Yeah. But. It's really interesting that it's such a quick fix. So yeah, I found that it's really interesting that I've had to go to three, three rubbish races to the, now we know what the problem is and hopefully I don't have to sit in a bush again in a race. Yeah, I think that's amazing that you know, you've got that information now and it yeah. just helps you, you know, move forward. That's a really bad running pun, but, but yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I think it's important to like unpick your races. And if yeah. you have a bad, sometimes it is just a bad race and you have to suck it up. Like yeah. you, you're trying to get all your training and everything ready for one day. Yeah. But I knew like inside that something was wrong. Yeah. Like I was like, I knew I underperformed and that is like a sign of energy deficit, like underperforming. And I knew there was more to it than just having a bad day because it had happened three times and I'd had that same feeling. I literally had no energy and just couldn't move forward. So yeah, it's, I think you should take the time to sit and reflect yeah. on all races that you do. As part of Carla's marathon training cycle for the Seville Marathon, she's competing at several races within her training program this includes a 10K race. In previous training cycles, the focus has been on competing at the longer distances, and this is the first time she's raced a 10K for six years. A lot of work has gone into the preparation for this race. She is targeting a podium finish and to achieve a personal best. What is one of the best pieces of advice that you've been given during your running journey? Oh gosh. Um, so one of the first coaches that I had so I'd gone through a period of where I would just drag my ass to the finish line on any race because I was trying to prove a point. And he had said to me, he's like, if you know that you're putting like your body in danger, just stop, pull out of the race, like regroup and then go and do another one. And it took me quite a while to let that sink in, to be like, actually, I don't have to prove a point to anyone. And if I am ill, and I can't do the race and I can't carry on because I've sprained my ankle or I'm being sick in a bush, then it's okay to stop and regroup and go and do it another day. And it's taken me to this year to do that. And I was probably given that advice like four years ago. Times we're like, oh, we're gonna let people down if we don't finish, but actually no one cares except you. And it's taken me a long time to realize that as well. Like, especially with, it's been really interesting with the marathon where some people have been devastated about that time because they've been two minutes slower. But actually, the only person that really remembers what time you were going for is you. Like, all your friends still think you're a legend because you finished a marathon. <laughs> you're like, and I was two minutes slower. This is what you said then. Do you think sometimes it's about proving other people wrong or proving yourself right? Yeah, I think. I was probably doing it to prove 
to other people that I could finish and that it shouldn't be about that. It should be about, yeah, you should do it to prove a point to yourself. So, you know, not finishing a couple of races this year was like pretty devastating, but I was like, actually, it doesn't matter. And it was for the right, I wasn't doing it. I think there's a point in a race where you can just give up and then you need to go and have a word with yourself and be like, come on, <laughs> let's go. But there's a fine line between knowing when to stop and when when to push and yeah you need to do it for yourself not for people watching on the sidelines but i think as runners it's sometimes really hard to know when that point is because you're just like i'll make it i'll make it and like, it is really yeah won't. yeah <laughs> like, i will <laughs> it is really hard and it's like i've been running for 20 years it's taken me 20 years to get to that point to know where that line is 